If you're here or you're at home, if your arms are crossed, uncross your arms. <laughs> uncross your arms. Okay? I promise you, about a quarter into the message, you're going to start to do this again. It's an outside representation of where God is going here, and it's uncomfortable. So if you're at home and you're under a blanket, take the darn blanket off, get uncomfortable with the rest of us, please. We're going to take a month to say what we, it's going to take us a month to unpack what we want to talk about. And so today I want you to think about it a little bit more like diagnosis. And we're going to get into treatment, but we're going to just begin to surface some challenges. And you saying yes or no to this journey, I want to let you know what's at stake. What could be at stake is what God wants to do next in your story. What could be at stake is the influence that you have or don't have with the next generation. Which could be at stake is if you are the next generation. What could be at stake is that you take down a fence before you know why the fence was put up. In other words, you're going to create unnecessary harm for yourself when it doesn't have to happen. And one of the things that this weekend symbolizes that we're going to use for a launching point to begin to deep, go deeper in is what happened to us during the pandemic. We want to talk about meaningful relationships. And we want to start with talking about unhealthy problems. Because resiliency in following Jesus means that each of us requires meaningful relationships. Think about it. One of the greatest miracles that Jesus performed wasn't only the relationship that Jesus cultivated with himself to his disciples, but it was the community that he created amongst the 11 or 12 disciples, excuse me. The community that he created amongst the 12 disciples is a miracle. In no other way, shape, and form would those 12 men have been in relationship with one another in no other way, shape, and form other than Jesus would we all be in relationship with one another. We have different perspectives, different backgrounds, different ethnicities, different genders, different worldviews, different hurts, different habits, different hang-ups, different classes, all of these things. Yet in Christ, we are one. All of us have families of origin, and every one of us come from a family of origin that is not perfect and healthy. Yet our Heavenly Father wants to minister to all of us as the family of God. Resilient disciples of Christ, they cultivate meaningful relationships with other followers of Jesus. They desire to be around and then become like themselves. We need one another to become more like Jesus. And sometimes because of our emotional unhealth... The very people that God keeps bringing into our lives, our unwillingness to allow God to address what is under the surface, God brings and we repel. God brings and we repel. God brings and we repel. And we blame everything else rather than let God go here. And God is beginning to go here. He wants to go here. And so I, one of the things I would encourage you is, if you've never heard of these resources, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality by Pete and Jerry Scasario. There's a book and there's a workbook. You can go through it as a life group. You, can, I, you don't go through it alone. Go through it at least with one other person. But it's called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. It's a partnership we're going to engage. We're going to use some of the material over the next month. But I encourage you to dig into it wholeheartedly. And here's the reason why, as I just said why this part partnership is vital, that we can teach through how critical, meaningful relationships are for each of us to follow Jesus. But if you or I, if we as the church do not allow Jesus to address the below-the-surface issues of our hearts, nothing will change. Nothing will change. We will consistently require more moves of God more, make more and more and more, and he is the God of more, but he's equally the God of deeper. And deeper sometimes is an uncomfortable invitation. Here's the critical issue that the church of Jesus is facing. For too long, we have defined spiritual maturity apart or by disconnecting it from emotional maturity. So in other words, I can be spiritually mature as long as I can quote the scripture, sing the song, and tell you what I want, tell you what you, know, what you need to know and what, what you think you want to hear. How you doing? Bless God, praise God, I'm doing great. But yet under the surface, you're a holy terror. 
you're emotionally unhealthy. There's areas of your life that Jesus wants to transform here so that we can be entrusted with the harvest. What's at stake, church, if we do not allow the Lord to heal us emotionally as well as in our minds in terms of what we leave? What is at stake? He will not entrust the harvest to an emotionally immature church. Jesus said it very clearly. It is one thing for someone to come to know Jesus. It is an entirely other thing for them to know Jesus and then not to be a part of a community that allows their roots to go down deeper, which is slow work. It can actually make them worse. John Tyson said that our aim as sheep should not be to do amazing things for Jesus or our aim as Jesus should not only be, I should say, to do amazing things for Jesus, but to have an inner life like Jesus, to develop relationships with others like Jesus. We are more like Jesus when we allow the Holy Spirit to heal our wounds and then to develop our Christ-like character continually within us, inch by inch, kilometer by kilometer. Jesus did not say, don't have enemies. You can do everything right and still have an enemy. It's outside of your control. You can do everything right and still have an enemy. You can do everything correct to the best of your ability in a relationship and it still goes sideways. Your 100% in any relationship isn't enough. You need someone else giving their 100%. You can't do all of it. You can't. you got to own your side of the street. Jesus didn't say don't have enemies. That's outside of our control. But what he said is when you discover that you have enemies, regardless of how you have them, your call and my call is to love them. That is within all of our control. I don't think you can do it outside of a work of the Holy Spirit. I don't think you can do it in your own strength. I don't know if you've ever had a genuine enemy, someone who saw something so very different from you, someone who was on the opposite perspective of you, someone who lived contrary to how you live, someone who believed the very things that caused your blood to boil. Jesus said, you're called to love them. As I was reflecting this week in this Lenten season, I was struck with the language. I was struck afresh this week with how Jesus treated Judas. In the Garden of Gethsemane, you know what he calls him? Friend. Go and do what you must do, friend. Does that sound like a man who has allowed spirituality to not just be here, but here? The very way that he was being treated, he moves into the opposite spirit. Jesus is the picture of everything that we're speaking about this month. I'm unsure. I'm not so certain the pandemic divided us or more revealed our existing emotional unhealth that was already there. But one of the things that I am certain is that the pandemic exposed a temptation to all of us And that is to be formed by our crowd rather than Christ. And your crowd could have formed around anything pandemic-related. Here's the confession. So we understand I'm not an expert in emotional health. I'm a fellow sojourner along the journey. In the early parts of the pandemic, I was shockingly judgmental towards others. I was bothered by their faults, and I was increasingly irritated by those who made different choices than I. And the last I checked, judgmental, bothered, and irritated are not not found in the fruit of the Spirit. Now, I've added them to my Bible so I feel better about myself, (laughs) but it doesn't make them true. I can't control that others see things differently. I can control how I love them, indifference. And I failed miserably, miserably. When you fail miserably at something, you have two choices. You have the gospel and you have religion. Religion says, fix yourself. The gospel says, in your failure, allow Jesus to move. Two different ways to live your life. 
and loved ones, when it comes to emotional unhealth, emotional health, emotional spirituality, emotional maturity, you are not going to find the world's going to help you in this way. They are going to cancel and they are going to shame and they are going to click you outside of their progressivism. You're not going to find. But if you look to the gospel, you will find something so uncomfortable, but yet so necessary. And so today, let's look at what happens to someone in the scriptures who keeps spiritual and emotional separate rather than integrated. Let's look at Israel's first king. Their very first king was a guy named Saul, a gentleman named Saul. He knew what it was to lead a tribe. Now he's going to lead a nation. And God picks him to lead a nation. And he goes from anointed to leading. But the thing that we see about Saul is this, is that he never deals with the unhealth of his heart. And we're going to see it at the end of the message, specifically what it was. Yours may be different from his, but you're going to see what it is. And so God comes along to King Saul, and he instructs Saul to attack the Amalekites, the enemy of Israel, at this time, and completely destroy everything that belongs to them. Everyone say, completely destroy. It's difficult in 2023 to look back in a different covenant, a different season. We can be very judgmental. But God instructs them to completely destroy all things that belong to the Amalekites. But due to the pressure to please the men that he leads, he does part. Everyone say part. He does part of what God requires. And then he uses real beautiful spiritual language to try to cover up his own disobedience. Saul is self-reliant. He focuses on success. He is formed by others, but he is not fully formed by obedience to God. Let's read. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 7 to 9, it says, Then Saul attacked the Amalekites all the way from Havilah to Shur, near the eastern border of Egypt. He took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive, and all his people he totally destroyed with the sword. But Saul, everyone say, but Saul. But Saul and the army spared Agag. God said, destroy everything. He spared Agag and the best of the sheep and the cattle, the fat, the calves and lambs, and everything that from their perspective was good. These they were unwilling to destroy completely. And then it says this. We're, we're, we're going back thousands of years looking at a different culture, but it says this. But everything that was despised and weak, they totally destroyed. If you think in the thousands of years from this story to where we are today that the world has changed so much, it isn't. Because we live in a culture that that which is despised and weak, we destroy. When we begin to calculate how much you cost to keep alive, we're not so advanced. We create a light bulb that enables us to like have all these technological... Now we have a light bulb, which means that like when the sun sets, we can do other stuff, but what do we do? We create a light bulb, and then we increase our working hours to 18 hours a day. Everything that we make technologically that pulls us forward can also be used to destroy one another. We create an internet that connects the world, and we've never been more lonely and divisive and vicious towards one another. Oh, there's beauty there too, I know. But if you look at the data of what just a smartphone and social media and 24-7 access, what it does to a developing heart, it is jaw-dropping. The issue isn't the tools, the issue is the soul. And Saul is clear on what God has asked him to do and he's asked him to lead. And Saul is being formed by success and self-reliance. And the Bible says that he sees what was good for him and his men. And then from selfishness, he takes for himself. He disobeys God and he surrounds himself with people who will only feed his ego, his actions, and ultimately his disobedience. How do you have toxic churches? Honor, biblically, always flows two ways. You honor leadership, and the leadership's call is to honor the people. Never one way. Be careful to be in environments where honor only flows one way. Something is amiss. 
Sometimes as leaders, you can begin to surround yourself with people who only tell you what it is that you want to hear. And all of a sudden, that which is in one person's heart begins to spill out, and now it's in a few people's hearts, and those few people begin to set a culture, and the culture begins to push down to everything, and all of a sudden, what you have thought is contained here begins to bleed out. And God knows this, because now he has a king over Israel that is acting in disobedience, and because God loves the king, and because he loves the nation, he sends a prophet by the name of Samuel. And I want you to hear this with both ears and your whole heart. There are some things in your life that can be redeemed. And everyone said, amen. There are other things that God will tell you to completely destroy. I'll give you an example. For some of you, drunkenness, for all of us, drunkenness is a sin. For some of you, Alcohol is permissive. It's not a sin. For others of you, you shouldn't come within 10 miles of it. You're free in Christ too, but you're foolish if you do. You can't redeem it because it destroys you and destroys your family. We're going to talk on a few more in just a moment. It's just an example of where I'm sort of going. So sometimes you can't look at people around and go, oh, it's good for them. What's good for the goose is not always good for the gander. <laughs> I've told the story numerous times. I was in a prayer meeting and I had both of my ears pierced because I was just that cool. <laughs> in the 90s. Greatest decade. Not really, I don't really care. And I was in a prayer meeting and the Lord said, I want you to take out your earrings. And I wrestled with the Lord for a few minutes, like, excuse me? <laughs> and so I took my earrings out, and I laid them on the altar, thinking, like, I'll put them in in, like, a week. And it was just a no. That God was working on, like, he, what he was actually working on was not my earrings. They meant nothing. What he was working on is an over-focus in my own heart and life on image that really shouldn't have mattered as much as it did. I understand that now. At the age, I didn't. But I get it now. I came into church the next Sunday, and there were two men in our church who got up and gave a testimony that God asked them to get earrings in their right ear. Yeah. 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 Standing over there, and I was like this. (laughs) If you ever get really angry at God, take your little fist, put it up in the air, and look at the immensity of the sky like you are threatening God. (laughs) Some things, loved ones, can be redeemed. Other things God will say for you, don't touch it. To Saul, he said about the Amalekites, don't touch it, destroy all of it. And by the time Samuel the prophet shows up, Saul's deception has become its truth. And that can happen to any one of us. We like to point it out in others, but sometimes we're ignorant to where it's occurring in our own lives. Let's keep reading. 1 Samuel 15, 10 to 15. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel, I regret that I have made Saul king, because he has turned away from me and he has not carried out my instructions. Turned away, by the way, is the word rebellion. Rebellion. The opposite of rebellion is the different turning of repentance. So in rebellion, we turn away. In repentance, we turn towards God. Okay? Same action, different God. Different thing that we're worshiping. And so Saul is in rebellion. He's in idolatry. He's turning away from God. Uh, Samuel was angry, and he cried out to the Lord all that night. And early the next morning, Samuel got up and went to meet Saul. But he was told, Saul has gone down to Carmel. Watch Saul. Watch how quickly this happens. Saul is in Carmel, and he has set up a monument in his own honor. Pause. Saul was the very first king of Israel. If you know anything about biblical history, everywhere that Yahweh, that God met with someone, they would create an altar for worship. Now Saul is the very first king of Israel, and he has set up an image in his own honor. Where has he learned that? From the culture around him, not his father. Not Yahweh, not God. He's being influenced 
by the world around him, by success. And he has gone and turned and gone down to Gilgal. Well, when Samuel reached him, Saul said, The Lord bless you. Everyone say spiritual language. language. The Lord bless you. That's fantastic. It's all spiritual language. The Lord bless you. I have carried out the Lord's instructions. But Samuel said, and this is an expression we must bring back in 2023. What is this bleeding of sheep in my ears? This must go into every school, every family, and every workplace. Next time you're in a meeting that is dragging on, I, I, you must take your cell phone out and record it somehow, but I want you just to say in the meeting, respectfully, but clearly, what is this bleeding of sheep in my ears? <laughs> Everybody will be like, yeah. Students, when your parents are yammering on, don't say it. <laughs> say it under your breath. What is this bleeding of sheep in my ears? <laughs> parents, when your kids are just yammering on, don't say it. Honor flows both ways. But if you could redeem that part, I think we should redeem it. I think it's worthy. What is this bleeding of sheep? It goes on to say, what is this lowing of cattle that I hear? I don't find that one impressive. But the bleeding of sheep, marvelous. Saul answered, the, sh the soldiers brought them from the Amalekites, and they spared the best of the sheep and the cattle. Watch the spiritual language. Saul has been disobedient. God said, destroy everything. They've kept the best of the best for themselves. Watch what Saul says. The only reason why we did that is to sacrifice them to the Lord your God. Spiritual language covering up disobedience. And this isn't a Saul problem. This is an all of us problem. We can use language that isn't really where we are at. We can lift our hands on a Sunday and walk out of this place and with the words of our mouth, tear down the very people that we love. Because we all come from wounded families of origin that are not behaving in the way that our heavenly house and heavenly father behaves. And we have to let God go there. We spared the best of the sheep and the cow to, sacri to sacrifice to the Lord your God, but we totally destroyed the rest. How many of you know that God is equally invested in the journey as he is in the destination? It's not that the ends justifies the means. It's not just that we get there that matters. It's how we get there with one another that matters too. We say it all the time as a team and as a staff, by the way, we're going through emotionally healthy this whole year as a staff. And let me tell you, it's not fun, but it is necessary and vital. When we do conferences, when we do everything at the church, we say it over and over again. It's not how we get to Sunday, and it's not how just that we get to the conference. It's that we love each other as we do it. That is just as important as the event itself. And if the end of the event is that we absolutely hate working with one another, then we may need to pause the event until we as a team can grow up and do it well with one another. Because look around. Just take a moment look around you right now. When we are in need, people are the only thing that matters. Not numbers, people. People matter. Saul, here he is. Enough, Samuel said to Saul. Let me tell you what the Lord has said to me last night. Tell me, Saul replied. Samuel said, although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel, and he sent you on a mission saying, go and completely destroy those wicked people, the Amalekites. Wage war against them until you've wiped them out. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? Saul, watch. Even when confronted with truth, what does he say? But I did obey the Lord. Saul said, I went on the mission the Lord assigned me. That is true. The next part is not true. 
I completely destroyed the Amalekites. And <laughs> I forgive you, but uh, you don't really forgive them. I, forg- I destroyed all the Amalekites and I brought Agag, their king. The soldiers took sheep and cattle from the plunder, the best of what God was devoted, I'm sorry, the best of what was devoted to God in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God at Gilgal. All spiritual language to cover up his own disobedience. Sounds really good. Doesn't it sound good? You've just conquered. You can increase your wealth. You can take liberally what's yours. You can, you can enlarge yourself. But that's not what God has asked you to do. It's disobedience. He's using all spiritual language and customs to hide behind what is really going on. Unhealthy spirituality can start when we surround ourselves with people who tell us what we wish to hear, but from love do not remind us of what God's word commands from us. And God sends Saul a Samuel and from love to remind him of God's ultimate truth. Again, some things can be redeemed, but other things need to be utterly destroyed. Let me let you in on a secret that you already know. Your spiritual adversary is absolutely fine with you achieving 90% freedom from sin in any area. As long as you leave the seeds of sin there, he's completely fine. In other words, you can, be, you can have 90% freedom in the area of greed as long as you withhold a seed of greed. He is totally fine to let you achieve that. He is absolutely fine for you to be 90% set free in the area of lust as long as the stronghold of lust remains. He's totally, totally fine to leave you, to allow your life to be set free from 90% of fear as long as the stronghold of fear remains intact. And he is absolutely over the moon for you to be set free from jealousy as long as there's just two people in this world that you remain jealous of. God does not need much to do extraordinary things in our lives. Your spiritual enemy equally does not need much. What he needs is the seed of legal access of an area of disobedience and unsurrendered unwillingness to allow God into this area of our lives. He just needs access to do what he desires to do. And this is the life of Saul. This is what Saul is doing. He's literally giving the enemy access using spiritual language to make himself appear to be different than he actually is. Spiritual and emotional health is setting our heart to follow God fully and honestly under the whole counsel of his word. And Saul is so deformed that he tries to reframe his own disobedience as devotion to God. And here's what I also wish to say in love and in gentleness You may have relationships in your life with people who want you to remain emotionally unhealed because you getting healthy disrupts their comfort. Saul tries to mask, masquerade his disobedience, his devotion. And what Samuel does next is critical. And what Saul confesses is key. Now we get to the heart of it. But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices? As much as in obedience and obeying the Lord? What what is he saying? Saul, God is not delighted when you take in disobedience and offer it as a sacrifice. It is not a sweet-smelling aroma to God. What God is just looking for is honesty and obedience. The thing that I have asked you to do, the thing that I've put my finger on for you, will you trust me there? He's not looking for all the spiritual language. 
What he's looking for is not, oh, Lord, look at everything I'm doing for you. What he's looking for, will you let me heal you here? Will you let me go here, wherever here is for you? Let's keep going to see what it says. Saul, Samuel says to obey is better than sacrifice. And to heed is better than the fat of rams. Remember when it said a few moments ago, Saul turned away? Watch Samuel call it out in love. For rebellion is like the sin of divination. And arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Now Samuel's really honing in. Because you turned away, because you rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Then Saul said to Samuel, then Saul said to Samuel, pause. When do you think was the opportune time for Saul to be confessional and honest? On the front end or the back end? Church, God's heart is not for you to get caught. It is for you to confess. But if you won't confess, he loves you so much that he's going to allow you to get caught. Why? Because when you're caught, there is an opportunity for honesty, for him to move, and for healing to begin to flow. When you look at the church and you see men like me who get caught and caught and caught, or women in the church get caught, it is not Absent from God's love, that is, a, that is a manifestation of God's love. But I promise you, his heart was not caught all along the way is that they would be honest and confessional. Watch. Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I have violated the Lord's command and your instructions. Last line of 24 gives you the reason why he did what he did. I was afraid of the men and I gave in to them. I was living under the fear of man. I was afraid of what the men in my life would think of me rather than lead them to do what is right. Now he's honest. Samuel reminds Saul of a transformative truth about God that our greatest sacrifice without obedience gains nothing. Christianity is exclusively built on the sacrifice of Christ. It includes us sacrificing, but we sacrifice in the direction of obedience, not the direction of earning. In Saul's life, his fear of others, his fear in this case, not of the Amalekites, his fear of the men that were closest to him, his fear of disappointing those closest to him was greater than his fear of God, his awe of God. And now he's finally seeing what is. In Saul's life, this is what drove his behavior. Tons of spiritual language, but none of it was true because emotionally he had not let God go here. Personal reflection, personal step, Word of advice. Three personal reflection questions for us today. In following Jesus, where are you just going through the motions? Offering sacrifices equals religious activity. What are you doing just mindlessly with your heart not engaged? Saul pretends to be someone on the outside that he isn't on the inside. Where is this true for you? Word of advice coming. Who do you have in your life who acts as a Samuel? Whom do you allow to speak God's truth so that you don't live from a false place or a false self? Personal step. You can visit emotionallyhealthy.org to take a free assessment to see how emotionally healthy you are. Emotional infant, adolescent, or adult. When I took this a uh, couple of years ago, I was an emotional adolescent. And everybody in my life and relationship was like, yeah, that rings true. <laughs> they knew it. Here's a word of advice. <laughs> you need a Samuel, 
not a hundred Samuels. Okay? The Bible says in the book of Psalms, it says that we're to guard our hearts, not put a wall up. If you invite a hundred Samuels, that's a lot of noise you're inviting into your life. Please practice selective transparency, never hypocrisy. You need someone in your life with whom you can be absolutely transparent, honest, vulnerable, the whole mess, nine yards. You need someone. And it's not their job to dig it out. You need someone in your life that you can be absolutely honest with. You need other people who you can be selectively transparent with so that you don't live in hypocrisy. And you also need to learn that there are some people that it's not healthy, it's not safe for you to be honest with them. You don't come into a relationship like, you know, the Lord's told me you're not safe. No, then you're not safe if you do that nonsense. You need someone. You need, a, you need a meaningful relationship. Someone in your life that you can be completely vulnerable with. I'm just transparent with everyone. That's not emotionally healthy. That's dumping. And some people can handle it and other people can't. And part of emotional maturity is knowing when and where and with whom we can do these things. We all need someone here's what I know. You have the Holy Spirit of God who is better than a Samuel. And the Holy Spirit knows what to put his finger on from love to go deeper in your life. We have an exercise that we want to close with and it can actually be very simple or quite profound, but let's take a moment to pray. Lord, we recognize that we're into weighty things. We're into unhealed parts of our hearts, unhealthy ways that we express our emotions. We're into wounding within relationships. We're into pain there. And Father, we don't come into here carelessly, but cautiously. But Father, we also don't want to be afraid to call out what is and what can be in you. We want to live with a healthy fear of you. And so for where we as life center have been disobedient, Father, we turn to you and confess our sin. Forgive us. Father, forgive us. May we be known as a community that wants the fullness of your presence to transform every part of our lives, including how we treat one another, in particular, our enemies, those different from us. Father, go there so that you can entrust us with a lost and broken world and that we will have the grace and patience to walk with them with the same grace and patience that you walk with us. In your name I pray.